So this semester we talked about um, the idea is to have some of the most powerful women in the entertainment industry, specifically the music industry, if you will. So tonight we are really, really fortunate because when you look at the list, and if you look at the billboard list of the most powerful women in the entertainment music industry, always at the top, at the top, the tippy top, is our guest tonight, um, Julie Greenwald. And I, I'm, I'm really thrilled that she took the time, has the interest to share some of her thoughts and notions with you guys, and will answer some questions, and that she took the time to do this is, um, and come out here from her very, very busy schedule, as you can imagine, uh, as a chairwoman of a, of a major record label. That's, that's a commitment, and we appreciate that, you doing that. Um, I, I've been blessed to know Julie since probably in the mid-90s, mm -hmm. um, when we first met, when Julie was uh, a big shot at uh, Def Jam Records. But um, uh, I think one measure of how Julie is as a person comes from a quote with one of her coworkers or one of her subordinates, if you will, and coincidentally, a, a female executive at the company who runs the promotion department, who's been there, I think she predated you probably. She's been there for 30 something years. Right. Yeah. So she said, quote, and think about this, a more extraordinary executive does not exist. She's smart and remains open. And I think that's really uh, the highest compliment you can get when from one of your coworkers says that about you, and it's a sign of respect, particularly somebody who has been there for that long. And that's Andrea Gannis, who's the... Uh, head of uh, promotion at Atlantic. Um, so I thought that was an interesting way to start things off. And as I usually do, I'll say, um, Julie, can you talk a little bit about how you got where you are today? I know you're from upstate New York originally. Uh -huh. um, this was a career path that you never really thought was going to happen. Nope. So um, if I'm not mistaken, your, your family, you grew up, you have um, Brothers, brothers? No, no, I am the third of four daughters. So I wasn't the oldest. I um, wasn't the middle child. I was the one that, um, by the time I came around, you know, I was the one that probably got the least attention, and then the baby happened. So I became the classic overachiever, right? I had to get noticed somehow. So um, I, you know, was a really great student and was captain of every sports team and president of everything. And I um, ended up picking a school based on the weather. Um, <laughs> I um, didn't like cold weather. So, um, you know, my parents were generous enough to say you could pick whatever um, university you wanted to go to. And um, I chose Tulane. So I could go um, be in the South, have great weather in a great city. And um, it was a fantastic four years because New Orleans is unbelievable and um, I was both poli-sci and English major and um, I did a lot of volunteer work um, at soup kitchens, um, shelters, I worked on campaigns, um, I worked, I interned for Senator John Bro. I thought my future was I was going to be a lobbyist. I wanted to end up in DC um, and um, so I figured I'd go to law school at some point, and um, I read about a program that just started called Teach for America. So I um, applied, I was like the second year in, and um, I asked to be stationed in New Orleans, and I ended up in Calliope Projects, which is um, right down from Central Lockup. And um, it was an incredibly difficult experience, and it was super challenging because the whole premise was, let's take really smart kids and ask them to volunteer. It wasn't, hey, let's get really qualified teachers to go teach. So um, I, it, was definitely, uh, it was definitely a tough experience for me. And um, it was right out of a movie. I went into an all-African-American school. There's this you know, 21-year-old white Jewish woman from the Catskills. And, um, and I loved it, but I also had, it was tough. So I came home that summer looking for a break to get out of New Orleans because I normally have really curly Jewish hair and no white Jewish woman stays down in New Orleans during the summertime because you have a Jew fro. So <laughs> I left New Orleans for the summertime to get out of the humidity and um, moved to New York City to be closer to my boyfriend. And um, uh, my cousin, who was working at Rush Management, said there is a um, 
job opening. Uh, the guy who runs Rush Management is looking for an assistant. So I thought, oh, what a great summer job. I could assist this guy, be in New York City, be near my boyfriend, and then figure out from there where I was going to go. You guys all know what Rush Management was and is? So Rush Management at the time, um, we were LL Cool J, Public Enemy, Run DMC, Tribe Cold Quest, Leaders of the New School, Brand Nubian, Positive K, um, it double X Posse. We were everybody in um, hip hop music, and um, it was awesome. And, um, and you're a poli sci major, and, and an English major. And you're and you're applying there for a job in the summer. Yeah, and and Lior said to me, you know, why should I hire you? And I said, because I'm really smart. I've got an unbelievable work ethic. I worked in my parents' drugstores my whole life growing up. There wasn't anything I didn't do, and, um, and I could type 50 words per minute. And um, his office didn't really have a setup for me, so I literally sat on the edge of a couch with a, with a shelf, and that was my chair, and my computer was there. And at one point, he comes up behind me, because he sat right there, and he sees me doing this. And he was like, and Lior has a crazy Israeli accent, and he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm, I'm working on an itinerary for one of the artists. And he says, you lied to me. And I'm like, what do you mean I lied to you? What did I lie to you about? And, and, and then all of a sudden he's like, you don't know how to type. <laughs> but by then we were like two months in, and we had gelled, and I was really smart, and I had a great work ethic. And so, you know, two out of three wasn't so bad. And so right. he kept me. And this is 1992? This is 1992. Yeah, I started July 6th, 1992. And then a couple of months into the job? He said, um, I really um, need to focus on Def Jam full time because Def Jam was in a really rough place. Um, they hadn't had any hot acts in a while. And he was like, I'm really uh, afraid that it's not going in the direction it needs to survive and the logo's too important. And he said, I'm going to. Um, shut down the management company, um, everything but Run DMC. And um, because at that time we had Chris Lighty as a partner, God rest his soul, and he said, I'm going to just give Chris his ax, and I'm going to focus on Def Jam. And he said, I would like you to go um, into the promotions department and learn another side of my business. And um, he made me the promotions coordinator. And um, at that time, we were going through Columbia. Um, Sony Music, and um, we didn't have a marketing department, and our urban promotions department was the most chaotic uh, place. The the person sitting over here didn't talk to this person over here, who didn't talk to this person, and um, so we would literally send an artist to D.C. to do BET, and not tell the radio guy that we were going to D.C. And I was so confused because I just came from the management side where we did these beautiful itineraries, and Leroy always was making sure these dots were all being connected, and I'd be like, so we're bringing EPMD down to DC to do BT Summit on a Saturday, but we're not doing anything with radio or going to Howard University to do something on the college campus. And they were like, listen, if you want to do it, you put it together. So I started to organize itineraries, and um, I programmed the fax machine. And um, so with one button, I could hit every urban radio station. And um, within like a year, I was promoted to GM of the department because they all thought I was some kind of brain surgeon. But it was your work ethic, and your, you, you worked crazy hours back then. You know, I was 22 or tw and going on 23, and what else was I going to do? I was learning this whole new culture in this new thing called the music business. And um, it was so crazy, because I would go home, and um, I told my parents I got this job at <laughs> Def Jam Records. And, they were like, what's a Def Jam Records? And, and I was like, it's all these rappers. And, and my parents, I think they cried. Um, <laughs> and um, the craziest part was is back then they had these numerical pagers where only a number would come up. Right. And um, because I had to be on 24-hour call. And um, I go home, and it beeps. And I look at it, and I have to call Lior. And my father says to me, you know, Julie, there's only two types of people that carry pagers, doctors and drug dealers. I didn't send you to medical school. And I was like, Dad, I promise you it's part of this whole business. Like, 
you have to be 24 hours a day, seven days a week, accessible. No, you don't have a personal life. And um, I didn't have a personal life. My 20s, especially my early 20s, all I did was work. But the boyfriend, you came down to, you wanted to be in New York to be near him. Oh, I ended up kicking him to the curb because all I did was work. Um, and I also just immersed myself so much into going to the tunnel, going to the Palladium, going to places that were all hip hop nights and learning everything I could about just rap music and this whole other culture that I, I had no understanding of. And the only way you could really promote it and um, work in it was to really learn from the inside out and going to college radio and seeing Bobito in action and how to work a DJ and going to a club and watching him work a DJ at a club, which is different than going to a college radio station and working the college DJ and how you convince somebody why they should play our music. You know, that because that Def Jam logo was cold when I got there. You know, and our job was, you know, to bring it back and to make it hot again. And then um, Def Jam was distributed then by Sony Columbia. Mm -hmm. And then wasn't there a time it was, it, you moved over? So what happened was is Lior sold, got Polygram to buy um, oh. the 50% back from Sony. And um, when he left Sony, we lost our marketing department, and um, we just signed this new kid called um, Warren G from the West Coast. And uh, he said, you know, I need someone to start my marketing department. And I was like, well, why don't we hire the guy from Columbia who used to work for us? And he was like, I don't want, I don't want any of them. I, I don't like the way they, they handled us. And I was like, well, who are we going to hire? And he was like, you're going to do it. And I was like... I don't know anything about marketing. Like at that point, I was like the promo. I was working urban radio. I was working DJs. I was like, I do promotion. I don't know anything about marketing. And uh, he said, you know, go um, go to the West Coast, go meet Warren G, and go figure this thing out. Oh, and we were also an East Coast label too. And I was like, the first project you're putting me on to market is a West Coast rapper. I mean, I was so. You know, and I was so defensive of East Coast rap, too, because I just came off of Onyx and um, EPMD and Redman. And uh, he was just like, listen, go learn. And he literally bought me like a one-way plane ticket and shipped me to um, L.A. And um, the only thing I had read about and learned about from reading the Source magazine was the Sloss and Swap meet. So I, I rented a car and drove myself to the Sloss and Swap meet. And um, surrounding the Sloss and Swap meet were all these... Um, buildings with these old billboards you know everything was these big eight sheets and I took them the number and I, I called the woman and I said um, hi I'm really interested in, in buying billboards from your company and, and I gave her the address of all these streets that I wrote down surrounding and she said to me honey you don't want to buy there like no one buys there that's our remnant space like uh, let me sell you on like sunset you know and um I said, no, 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 I need this. And she like literally for like $10,000 sold me like a million billboards. Well, Warren G called up Lior and was like, cuz you must be spending a million dollars on me. Like little did he know it was like, you know, remnant space. But if I didn't go out there and actually drive around and like figure out like where are my people of who I have to actually sell the records to, I don't know if I, I couldn't have done it from New York. It was the most valuable um, lesson I learned, which was who's the demo and how do I get to them? And what's the most efficient way to get to the demo? And it really taught me that, um, you know, got to have a lot of different plays in my playbook, that every artist is going to be different and that I got to figure out who they are and identify who's the first ones in and spend all my money getting to the first ones in. So back to when you were in Tulane, mm -hmm. you obviously were not in, into the hip hop music or rap music. Not at all. So like, what were some of the what was some of the music we? If you had an iPod back then, or what was? Oh my God, I, I must have burned out um, Ten Thousand Maniacs in my tribe. I listened to Depeche Mode. Um, I listened to a lot of different just alternative um, music. Echo and the Bunnymen. Um, I did do concert committee. Um, you know, just because the guy I was dating was doing concert committee. So I said, okay, I'll do concert committee too. So um, there, was, there was a little music in my um, college career, you know. I took Simply Red down to um, Pat O'Brien's and got them hurricanes after their concert. <laughs> so this is what, uh, this is probably late 90s? 
late 90s, I, no, middle 90s, I was um, doing marketing and I was doing, um, Lior said to me, you're doing such a good job on marketing. He said, I'd like you uh -oh. to take over the art department. I said, I don't know shit about doing art. And he said, figure it out. And then he said, listen, you're doing such a good job running the art department. I'd like you to now run the video department. I said, I don't know shit about the video department. I, I wouldn't know a key grip from a lighting guy. Like, and, uh, and he said, go figure it out. And um, by the time I was like 26, I was running Def Jam. Like, there was no department that, you know, he hadn't handed me to say, hey. Um, and it was because he trusted me so much. Um, he knew that that company was my company and that um, I watched every dollar and that everything I did was for the artists and what was good for that logo. And that was my most important job was I was the keeper of that logo. And I used to have to figure out like, does this artwork hold up? Is it make the logo hot or does it put whack juice on the logo? And literally that's, I would shelf a video if I thought it would hurt the logo. Yeah, there's a famous story. Um, uh, you, you commissioned a video yeah. that never got... There, I, uh, there's a few famous ones. I, I commissioned the uh, LL video that we ended up shelving. That was a few hundred Gs. And then the Cisco video, right, um, the, the, the one where he fought with the dragon. Well, the dragon won because I didn't put the video out. It cost us a million dollars. A million dollars for one video? Yeah, that's when we were selling a lot of records. Right, well, that's when videos, a quarter of a million dollars for video was pretty standard, if I recall. That was pretty standard, and you could break an artist off of MTV, so the investment was well worth it. If you got your video on MTV, MTV could break in any artist they got behind back in the day. Right. And we weren't necessarily getting on MTV, so when we finally got on MTV, whew, made they all get, the difference. They ghettoized a lot of the stuff that you MTV raps. Initially, yeah, yeah, and that was only the clean stuff. Right. Oh, part of my job, oh, too, yeah, was went with Onyx, because they were throwing the guns in the air. We had this thing called The Box, which was like a local video channel in every city, and you could call and request your own videos. Right. So I would leave Def Jam, I would go home, and then I would literally sit there with two phones, with two lines, and call The Box and request their own videos. In the New York area or around the country? At first I was doing New York, and then I figured out I got from Les Garland the list of all the videos, and then I would do it by how we were helping out where songs were getting played in other markets, like how to tackle DC and Philly, you know, and work our records that, that, that way. Was, that was expression was called jacking the box. Totally. And then it finally hit me, what kind of schmageggy am I doing this? Why don't I just hire some interns to do it and have them jack the box as opposed to me spending my nights dialing for dollars. And there were a lot of companies that you could hire back then. A lot of people started companies to jack the box. Yeah. Which was, you know, yeah. Cause what was it? It was a dollar a request, I think. No, it was more than that. It was like a buck, like thirty-nine. Right, and then and then they put a premium on top of that for doing that for you. So people were very entrepreneurial and said, "Okay, you can hire me, and you'll give me a list of what videos you want me to play and target what areas." What markets, uh huh? So that was a great way to market stuff and start when videos really had an impact totally. before YouTube. Totally. So why? What made you decide to shelve those videos? I mean, what they were so detrimental to the artist, they would have. They were laughable. The the Cisco one was horrific. He, he fought a dragon, and like 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 you know, it's just, and you knew going in it was the worst concept. But this, this you know, this is the problem, right? Um, after Kevin Costner made Dancing with Wolves, he made Waterworld. After Cisco got done making the Thong song, selling six million albums just in the United States, and like you know, God knows how many around the globe. You can't tell somebody that that thing right. is the worst thing ever because he says, I made the thong song, and everybody thought that was going to be crazy and retarded. So, you know, LL always had up and downs where Mr. Smith was selling this, and the, it was always, you know, which happens to a lot of artists, that they sell a lot, and then the next one, you know, there's no telling them because they just came off of such a huge success. And then the marketing of, of rap music at least initially, it was very different than the marketing of, of rock music because there was always, I remember Lior talking about, you know, it's like an opening of a movie. Like the first week for a hip hop artist is, is like so crucial because if you don't get that huge expandive opening. You know. Well, you know, this was the thing. Hip hop music is so based on, back then especially, it was so based on bravado right. and boasting. 
you were the king of your city. You know, we always said you had to get your backyard and you had to be the biggest and the best. And it was all based on talking good shit, like I'm the boss, I'm the biggest. And so movies, the biggest box office. If you are the biggest, you're going to show everybody come Tuesday that you got the most fans. And we put so much pressure on the first week right. number. I think we're responsible for causing that that shenanigans of just putting so much pressure on an opening week because then we would show the world because remember we're still convincing the world that rap music was mainstream music and we were still I mean you, you don't understand I showed up with a guy named Jay-Z and MTV fought me for God knows how many years to make him a big act getting him on the music awards was very challenging they didn't just say oh yeah he's jay-z put him on like the first year i booked him on the show they made me do it as a combo performance with dmx it just so happened that dmx didn't show up so he got his own slot but you know <laughs> but you know they didn't look at jay-z like eminem right and we were always so mad because we were like our guy matters more and they're like no this guy's elvis you guys always felt like you were the second-class citizen. We were the second-class citizens. Everybody was, everybody was getting the benefit of the doubt except the Def Jam artists. You guys had to work extra hard to prove the value of the repertoire. They kept, we had the song um, Method Man featuring Mary J. Blige, You're All I Need, which the New York Times Magazine, I'll never forget, called it the, lo the, so the love song of the summer. We got all this critical praise for the song, and um, MTV wouldn't play the video. They said it was too dark. The song was so big. We even got Puffy to do a remix to try to make it more friendly and less scary for them. And, um, and they still wouldn't, um, they wouldn't play it. And then their standards and practices drove you crazy because there were things that they didn't tell you. And then you deliver a video and you say, Julie, we can't show this video because X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so so it was always. Go back and, it was and always. It always just seemed to be a double standard for what was yeah. acceptable. And not. I mean, I, I tried to convince him that this little guy named DMX was a really big star, and we had this song called Get At Me, Dog. And um, but they obviously didn't want to play it, and um, they wanted us to change his lyrics. <laughs> so they said, we'll play it if you change his lyrics. So I go to the studio, and um, he's, they said he's going to get there around like 1, 2 in the morning. So I said, cool, I'll get there, whatever. So I show up at 2 in the morning to see him, and I said, X, man. MTV, I think I can really get them on you, but, but you're going to need to change your lyrics. And he said, what? And I said, I, I need you to change your lyrics, and, and I'm going to be able to get you on MTV, and it's going to help you become really big. And we know you're big in the streets, but we, we want everybody to come to the party. And he looks me in the face, and he says, real dog sniff blood. And I said, what? <laughs> he said, real dog sniff blood. And I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, what is this guy talking about, right? And it hits me that his fans will get to him, he doesn't need to change his lyrics, and that we have to just stay our course. And that, you know what, it's not gonna get on MTV, but that the real fans of hip hop and his, you know, Dark Man X, his poetry, are gonna get to him and he's not changing his lyrics for anybody. So the next day I come to work and Leo calls me in his office and he says, did you get Lee, uh, DMX to flip his lyrics? And I go, Real dog sniff blood. And Lear was like, what? And um, I'll tell you, um, we released that album probably in like, let's say April. Um, we sold a lot of records off that first album. Lear also came up with the crazy notion that he was so hot and on fire, let's drop another album in December. No one ever put out an album in December. Everybody at physical retail said to us, you can't put out an album in December. Lear said, why not? It's the best time to put an album. Kids are going to have uh, Christmas money. It's going to be a stocking stuffer. No, retail won't rack your record. He says, watch this. And, um, and he said, and because it's only coming out on the third week of December, I don't have to pay that much co-op. Because right. they used to stick us up and make us pay bazillions of dollars to put, we used to have to pay retail bazillions of dollars for the privilege of us putting the records in their record store for them to sell it. Right. It, was, it, was, it was such a criminal activity of what used to happen back in the day. Um, and this way he figured no co-op. And literally, my marketing plan for DMX was we had this fire single called What's My Name. Um, we dropped the video a week or two weeks in front, went to radio. And I literally spent 100 Gs on BT and 100 Gs on MTV. And we sold like 860-something thousand albums first week.
Yep. Yep. Two hundred thousand dollars plus a video and radio. That was it. It was the good old days, Steve. Yeah, really, <laughs> really. So you, so you guys are now at Polygram, which doesn't exist anymore. Now it was absorbed by Universal, but mm -hmm. back then it was a standalone. Yep. And things are going along. You guys are putting out records. Oh, we were killing it when Universal acquired um, Polygram. We were making more money than Island, A and M, everybody, Mercury, and the Universal family, and we had 14 artists on the roster. And, how, and, and a, a, a smidgen of employees compared to those labels. We had um, 60 employees, and then the reason why is Sorry, because say that again, how many? 60, and it was because every one of our artists was gold, platinum, or multi-platinum. If you if you walked into Def Jam and you were only gold, man, you if people would make so much fun of you and slick talk about you. Like, and, and Leroy was brilliant because he set it up like Gladiator. You know, Jay wanted to kill X, X wanted to kill Ja, Ludacris, Ja wanted to kill Ludacris. So they were all fighting. So every year, every November, like clockwork, they would all drop new albums because they all wanted to be King Kong. It was brilliant. We ended up not having to break any new acts because every year, the biggest of the big were coming back and just selling so many records. Um, it was beautiful. So then, then what then what occurred as far as so the company was sold and you in guys... 1999 um, we sold it and um, Lior said to me um, I'm not getting personal but when you use the pronoun we so Lior said I mean you were loyal to him he was loyal to you so I mean listen I was very very lucky when I was 23 Lior said to me listen you are a little superstar. I never want you to leave me. People are going to start to figure out who you are. And you're going to get phone calls. And I don't want you to ever think about leaving me. So if you stay with me, I promise you, this little company called Def Jam is going to be worth a lot of money. I'm going to make you a, you're going to become an owner. I'm going to give you a piece of my company. And um, I didn't know about anything. So I was like, OK. Whatever. OK. And this is how retarded I was. I didn't even ask for a piece of paper because I didn't even know that these things called contracts existed. First of all, we didn't even have business cards. We didn't even have compute. We didn't even have credit cards when I first started. I mean, it was cash, and then you got reimbursed back for cash. Um, and um, he gave me a piece of his company, and um, it was smart on his behalf because I never questioned my salary or getting big fat raises. And you know, the first time Puffy called me and said, "Baby girl." You should come over here and work with me. I was like, I, I, I can't. Like, you know, this is my company. And um, it really kept my head down because also now I'm working really harder and harder and I'm driving a multiple. And it was a genius plot because he literally locked me up and put the battery on my back that if I out hustled everybody and helped him build this business, um, he took the lion's share, but I still, yeah. you know. So yeah, but it was a it was a sad day because we were on such a high. I and he said, you know, Lear, Russell wants to sell, but we were on fire. And I was like, I don't understand. Like, there was so much to still do, but he wanted access to running a pop and rock department. He wanted top forty radio. He hated the fact that we had to go through Island Mercury and beg right. to get our records on other formats. And that's when he said they were distributed by a major ent entity through a secondary label, so whether it was Mercury or Island or, or whoever, they, they had to wait for a priority. So if there were other records in the way, they had a fight to, to jump over that, and it, it used to drive them crazy because they knew they had the hot goods. And, and with hip-hop, it's a very perishable thing. A rock record might stick around a little bit longer, but, but a hip-hop record is very perishable, and you need it now. You need it now, and you can't wait, and so you're like, like at an airport, you're at runway and you're waiting to take off and these other guys are getting in front of you and it would drive the Def Jam folks crazy because mm -hmm. they want to be there now, they have to be there now and they can't wait. And so they would go from Island, they went to, when, I think you guys went to Mercury for a while. Mm -hmm. It was just, so I guess he finally decided, let's try something different. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he sold the rest of the company. He sold the other half and, um, and we took Island, Def Jam and Mercury and pushed them together. And he became the president of that. And um, he asked me to take over the white side and run the rock side so of like marketing. So you were president of Island, right? Yeah. And um, 
and he said, you know, I'd like you to take over the rock side. And I was like, white people? I don't know shit about white people. <laughs> Why? I was the queen of hip hop. I was like, are you kidding me? I mean, I was on fire. And uh, I was like, man. And, uh, and also just the whole thought of like going on the warp tour. Like I was like, ew. You know, like, because I went to, with the, this guy I started dating, you know, he started taking me to these little, like, dirty rock clubs. And I was like, this isn't sexy, you know? And, uh, but, um, but he, Leora said, listen, it's really important for your growth. You have to grow. And we need, um, he needed to grow, and he wanted me to grow. And he said, it, it's time. You've done this long enough. You're great at the urban side. You now need a new challenge in life. And, um... And, you know, he said, let's do it. And um, I took all the principles I had learned from Def Jam about marketing on the streets and street teams and going around radio. And we were the first label, actually, to have a website. Def Jam was the first label to have a website. Um, and um, took the stuff we started learning from, from these nerds that we had hired and um, started to apply it to the island side. And um, it was really just, you know, it was really amazing because... Here I was at like 20, you know, eight years old, and um, I was like, wow, a whole new business for me. And he did make you president, right? Yeah. So in, in just to go back to the major theme here, so Julia, 28, is president of Island Records. Um, I believe there's only two other female executives um, who have achieved that. I mean, Florence Greenberg back in the 60s at Scepter Records. Um, well, when I came in, when I, when I finally became president, Polly Anthony was president right. of Epic. And, 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 uh, and Sylvia, probably. Sylvia was somewhere. She was Electra, and yeah. Michelle was at Sony. But she wasn't president. She, she was, was business affairs. She was some, she, no, she was a big dog. Her yeah. and Tom, Tommy were big dogs at Sony. So there were a few. Um, but she's amongst, it's a very small handful. I mean, um, right or wrong probably wrong. It's a very male-dominated industry. and, and It's and still a very male-dominated industry. And Julie is... Hasn't changed much. No, that's true. That's true. You and know, when you, you, you look at the power list, like, they do the women in music list, and you go, wow, look at all these amazing women. And then when you get to the power list, you go, oh, where are all the amazing women? Well, one of them's here tonight. Oh, we're thank very, you. We're, we're really lucky. Thank you. So you're an island... And I guess one of, I guess one of the earliest ones you, you, you applied some of your hip hop was uh, that Canadian band Sum Forty One. Yeah, yeah, we had Sum Forty One. We had, listen, we were very lucky because Def Jam again was kicking off so much money. Lior said, "Listen, we're going to just slow the whole company down and literally stop at the island side." Um, and we said, "Listen, let Def Jam really pay, and let's focus on a handful of artists and let's break them." And we signed um, Sum Forty One, American Hi Fi, and Saliva. And we really put all of our resources into those three bands to break those three artists, which then got us Hoobastank, which then, you know, brought us, you know, Fall Out Boy, which then brought us The Killers. Like, it was like, he was really smart about really small, really focused, same kind of thing of what we did at Def Jam, that less is more. And that if we just focus and stay in it, we could develop and break um, some artists on the pop and rock side until... We got Mariah Carey came over to us. Um, we were able Bon Jovi. We brought them back. We had this song called "It's My Life." No one he wanted. Was cold. He was no cold one wanted to mess with Bon Jovi. They weren't selling tickets. They were big in Europe, and we had this gorgeous, amazing song that took us like nine months to get that song. We we tortured our head of promo, Ken Lane. I mean, every day for nine months, we talked about one song, and we wouldn't let him off the hook. And then we got it, yep. and then the next thing you know, they're selling out Giant Stadium again. It was, yep. it was the wildest ride. And then they became massive again in Europe, and then it haloed their whole comeback. But it was literally just the com to stay in one song. You don't get that luxury, but we did because we weren't putting out a ton of records on the pop and rock side. And also Def Jam, that we also got Ashanti, who ended up selling a lot of records. Like, so it was just it was a great... It was a great experience. It taught me a lot, and which, when I went over to um, start Atlantic and put Atlantic and Electra together, I, I stole all of Leora's plays. I, I 
stop the whole company. We're going to focus on one project right now. It's Rob Thomas, <coughs> and then it was from there James Blunt, and it was the same premise, which is we're going to do, we're going to do more with less, and we're going to just focus, and we're going to have to have the best batting average in the league because we're not going to put out a lot of records, and that's the only way we're going to survive. So um, you were running Island for, well, I guess two years maybe it was, and then. It was a few years. And then, and then Lior got an, another opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, he was wooed away by uh, Warner. Warner Music Group. Right, and um, I guess he. He wanted, at that point he was so excited because Island Def Jam was the number one label in the country. Yep. And he was like, there's no place else to go. We did it, we showed everybody we're just not hip hop people. We could do pop and rock music. And um, he wanted the big job. He wanted to run a music company, a music group, and um, so I'm in the life is too short category. I said it's all about the people I work with, and um, as sad as it was to leave all my artists, um, I, you know, left and went with um, Lior. And, um, so he took the corporate job? He took the big corporate job, and me, like a schmageggy, again, I didn't read the paper, um, and I didn't look at who was on the roster. I just followed. And all of a sudden I get there and I say, hey, so who's on Electra and who's on Atlantic? And it turns out that over the last 10 years, both of those labels had a very challenging time. And they had Missy Elliott left. Um, she was there. They had Kid Rock. They had Matchbox 20. They had Stained. Um, it was barren. So um, I tell this to everybody. Necessity is a mother. We literally had to break acts because we didn't have them. No, there was no urban, really, was there? No, there was no urban. When I got there, we had signed um, T.I. and Trey songs. They had Trick Daddy and Trina when I got there. Oof. So um, it was really, uh, we had a lot of work to do. So, you're, you know, it's a legacy company. I mean, Amit was still, if I'm not mistaken, Amit was still, still there. alive. Mm -hmm. And he's chairman, you know, above all else, and here you are coming in. Mm -hmm. So how did, how did the chemistry work there? Because he's, if anything, he old was, school at the time. He was, let me tell you, he was so hopeful because he was like, all he wanted was to see his company return to health. And um, he was really supportive and um, literally would, I remember I said, listen, there's this young guy, Trey Songs, and I went into his office, I played him the music, and I said, he makes great R&B music. And literally, I got him to write on his letterhead a letter to every different urban program director saying, I know R&B music. I'm the guy that brought you Ray Charles and, you know, Aretha and Ruth Brown. This guy has real, you know, rhythm and blues in his body. Um, oh, I used him. I mean, I made him call Barbara Walters when we were trying to break James Blunt. I, I, Amit's Rolodex was insane, of and um, he loved music, and... Um, Probably loved the fact somebody was asking him to help. Yes. I remember Narles Barkley. Um, he, the guy used to walk with a cane. He literally went all the way up the steps um, to see Narles Barkley the first time they performed at Webster Hall for us in the VIP section. Um, he came out because he was like this. He was so excited that we had cool, exciting stuff. He literally would come to... He would come to every show, and then after show, party, hang, I would be like, all right, I'm going home now because i got to go to work tomorrow. And he's like, you're not going out? Right. And I'd be like, it's 1 in the morning. Right. And like, He's nocturnal. 80 years old, and he was going strong. You know? Yeah. So in 2004, they made you president of Atlantic Records, and mm -hmm. then five years later, they gave you another title, right? A chair. Chairperson, chairwoman, COO. You know, I, I really don't know the dates of when everything right. happened, but it was it was it was a few years later. Yeah, yeah. And then, so let's talk about your secret sauce. You're you're going into a brand new company, mm -hmm. and there's a corporate culture there, albeit they don't have a lot of hits. And there was a horrible culture there. So both sides were horrible. I ran around the building and I said to everybody. Listen, I didn't come here to be Atlantic, and I didn't come here to be Electra. I'm coming here to start the new company. And um, I was also uh, eight months pregnant when I showed up. And, um, and literally, I had to meet with, I don't know, each company had hundreds of people. 
and we had to downsize and go to a 200 person Oof. size company. So I literally had to run around and meet hundreds and hundreds of employees and decide who we wanted to stay and who I had to unfortunately let go of. And a lot of it was all based on just my gut of who wants to be down for the new culture, who looks at the past and says, that sucked. And, you know, and the ones that were like, it's great, I was like, oh my God, I can't have you here. Because if you can't recognize the problem, I don't know how we're going to fix it. And so um, that was really my barometer, was who was signing up to like tear down um, just the bad practices and bad habits of flinging records to radio and signing too much and not doing artist development and not building anything. And um, I was like, no, man, that's not how it's going to get down. And, um, you know, and so I quickly hired a bunch of people, fired a bunch of people. I moved my C-section date back, uh, got as much done as possible. And then uh, I gave birth and uh, I took a few weeks off. And um, Lear called me and he was like, when are you coming back? And I literally cried on the phone because I was like, I just had a baby. And uh, he was just like, yeah, but we need you. You got to get back here. And uh, I thought for, this was my second child. And I thought I learned something from my first child, which was I should really take a maternity leave. But I, did, I, I, I messed up on my first child where he kind of took away my maternity leave. And so I, I vowed I wouldn't let him do it twice. And sure enough, he got me back. And, um, and it, was, it was a lot of heavy lifting. And, um, but this was the thing. I was in every meeting. I still sit in every marketing meeting today because I was like, I'm going to have to teach people the new way. And the only way to teach is to actually be in there, be vulnerable with creative marketing ideas and lead and, and let people know that like there's different ways to do it and say, no, we're going to do it this way. And we're going to take our time and do a lot of touring and a lot of street teaming and a lot of digital marketing and a lot of content and you know we came up with this idea of we called it buckets we didn't know how to name content we didn't know how to, and we had this whole thing where we spent all this money creating buckets of content and and who knew you know this was before youtube right we were just making it for our websites we were definitely a content creating company before youtube happened so when youtube did happen we already were ready. You had, we were, you, had, you had the content to share. We had content to share, and we were also set up with a video and content department that was already teaching people because handheld cameras, the price had come down so cheaply right. that literally when we would sign an act, they would get like a care package of, you know, we'd give them, uh, uh, what do you call it? We'd give them an iPod. We'd give them a, you know, a handheld video camera. We'd give them so much stuff as like our starter kit to like just get them on the road um, and start teaching them from really early, way before um, YouTube, we were already like going, you know. So as a sidebar here, um, so you mentioned when you moved to New York, it was for a boyfriend, and then you got so immersed in work, you pushed him to this side. Yeah. So now you have two kids. Yeah. Somehow you found time to date and find the right guy to get married. <laughs> you know. People yes. wonder, how do you balance? I mean, you're, you're a very successful, aggressive manager and get stuff done at the end of the day. But then there's this other side of you. You're a parent and you're a wife. Yes. Uh, I mean, how does that work? I mean, I'm sure a lot of people here are like going, well, how can you have it all? Be married, have kids, and a successful career. And I got a new dog. <laughs> okay. So at any time at 6.30 in the morning, you could see me downtown walking a dog in Tribeca or... When I get home tonight, I'll do the, uh, the late night shift. of. Um, I have a little Pomeranian that I just got. And um, I, bet you, I, bet you, I bet you moved at least once or twice since coming to New York. I've moved, and um, I actually just bought a home in um, Brooklyn. I'm going to, thank you, I'm going to move to Brooklyn in a few years after I renovate this sucker. But um, first of all, this is the thing. There's no such thing as balance. I've thrown that concept out the window. I do the best job that I could do for me and my family. And, um, and that's all I can do. And, you know, but you I, still have I that pager, even the, I mean, built in ment mentally that like it's 24 seven and, and it, if somebody needs you. So this is the thing, I, it's taken me a really long time to um, figure out that 
the uh, important stuff is when, first of all, when I'm in a meeting, I am BlackBerry free. I cannot stand it when I'm running a meeting and people are on a BlackBerry. So I, when I'm running meetings, and I sit in a lot of meetings, I am not on a BlackBerry. I have learned how to put that sucker to the side and get to the emails and messages when I need to get to them. Um, because there's nothing worse than when you're sitting there talking to someone and they're on their device. So I don't want to do that to anybody, So um, especially my children and my husband. So when I'm home, and um, doing, I do Shabbat dinner every week with them. Um, that, that's uh, Friday night Sabbath dinners. I come home every Friday night and always do Shabbat dinner. And um, that thing goes to the side. And I check it at 9 o'clock at night to see, like, did the world blow up? Am I OK? Is there anything I need to deal with? And at 6.30, as I'm going home, I'm on a call. I'm dealing with something. I say, hey. Can I, you know, can we deal with this tomorrow? Can we deal with this Sunday? Like, and I push it off unless it's really, really urgent because somebody is in such a funky or bad place that I have to deal with it. But, you know, and everybody's understanding. And everybody says, sure, let's deal with it on Monday or let's deal with it this weekend at a better time. And I say, you know, I just got home. I need to see my kids. You know, when you say, when you use the kids' words, even artists back off you and say, oh, wait, call me back. Unless, like, they're in jail and I got to get them out. You know, um, which we're a full service company, we will get you out. Um, uh, but, you know, everybody's very understanding. And, and it's all about your own, you know, I don't have to prove anything to anyone anymore. I'm not, right. I'm not on the climb. Right. Now I am, I, I, I'm like the tree of wisdom. That's how I think of myself now. My job is to kick wisdom to the youngins. My job is to be a great bouncing board and to also be a great um, coach and mentor. And my job is to also just avoid the potholes and have a different point of view because I can see things from being in it in the marketing meetings, but I also have so much experience of um, being able to look at a project from you know 30,000 feet up as well because I'm looking at a P&L and I'm looking at it from a financial or from a global perspective of how it's going to impact the company or the corporation, not just what it's going to do for the artist or for our own um, label. And so um, I'm at a different point in my life. And so I can um, go home between the show and quickly go give everyone a hug because the show's at the Bowery Ballroom and I live downtown, and then run back out the door. Because if the artist isn't going on at 10 o'clock at night, I don't necessarily need to um, go out. I can dip in and dip out. So what's more difficult, managing staffs or managing artists' careers? I mean, it's, it's, it's much harder managing an artist's career. You know, artists are the most interesting people on the planet. That's what makes them artists. And um, there are artists that get it's a business and understand that it's also a job. And unfortunately, there's a lot of things they have to do to have great success. And then there's a lot of artists that just want to be in the studio and create the music and don't want to do the 90 million other things it takes to really, you know, move music and sell music and, you know, have fans and stay engaged with fans. And, um, you know, you find yourself so many times wanting it more than they do. And it's heartbreaking because you're just like, you're so talented and the world should hear you and see you, but it's a lot of work. America's so big. To really do America right, you have to tour it and tour it and tour it. Um, and you gotta get out of the 12 major markets and you gotta go visit all the secondaries and tertiaries. And, um, and then God willing, you conquer America, the globe is even bigger. Right. And it just takes a lot of wear and tear on the body. And then while you're doing that, you know, not only are you touring, we're asking you to talk to a million different people. You know, there's so many more people to talk to now. You know, it used to just be one radio jock. It's fragmented. It's so, there's so many millions of, of uh, you know, online people that want you, bloggers we need you to talk to, fanzines we need you to talk to, magazines, newspapers, college papers. And everybody wants. Everybody wants to interview you. And um, we don't know how we're going to catch the demo so all over the place now because the internet has music everywhere um, that um, we need you to talk to a lot of people. And we also need you to do your socials all the time. Right. Because fans, they want it. They want to be fed constantly. Yep. 
And so um, it's, it's, listen, Jay-Z doesn't do half this shit because he didn't have, he, social media wasn't around. So he's like, it, I'm not doing it. Right. Right? Yep. He doesn't have to. But the youngins, you know, Ed to. Sheeran is on his grind. That guy works every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. He does not take a day off because he stays engaged with his fans. It's a lot of work. And he's touring the globe. And literally he gets off the plane from China and he has a message for me saying, I need you, 911, call me. And he's like, I just landed in China. And I'm like, listen, we're going for a number one record. You, you need to right now, he's like, I need to go through customs. I'm like, no, 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 no. I need to connect you right now with Kid Craddock radio station because you need these spins. You have to get on a syndicated radio. And he's like, I think I'm going to get arrested. I'm like, it's going to be worth it. We're going to get you the number one record. Just stay on the phone. And he Straight. got the number one record. And, and deservedly so. And, but it's that kind of commitment yep. that separates the pact of just, it's so hard to break these days. To really break and break big, you got to work your tail off, man. Yep. I, I want to di divert a second away from the label thing and, and talk to you about the male-female thing. It's a, as we talked about, it's a very male-dominated. And you had a very, have and continue to have, I suppose, a great relationship with Lior, which mm -hmm. is almost, I mean, I witnessed some of your dialogue, and you guys are almost like brother and sister. I yeah. mean, and you, you say stuff that, you know, the HR department would cringe yes. if they overheard. And, you know, and that's between you, you mean two. You yourself isn't in the handbook? <laughs> No, I've heard, I actually heard him call you worse than that. <laughs> I had to leave the office because I was so uh, uncomfortable. But, <laughs> but, it, but, it does, but it doesn't matter because that's the way you two guys communicate and, yeah. and there's love there at the end of the day. Yes. But I just wonder the encounters you have along the way with managers, artists, agents, or just coworkers mm -hmm. or anybody, you know, treating you differently as, as a woman. I mean, because there aren't a lot of powerful women executives so do you run into that male-dominated, chauvinistic thing ever? So um, it, it was always my advantage at Def Jam because I could have every hard conversation with every artist and no one would swing on me. So I was the one that got sent in to deliver the bad news that we were losing the record or that, like, you know, the record was a stiff. Um, and, um, or if we needed an artist to do something, um, I, had, I was able to, like, rub their shoulders a little bit more and get artists to move. And I always used to say one of the reasons why um, I got promoted and got to where I did was because I can move talent. I could get J, I would go see X, I'd go, I, I had great relationships with all the artists and they trusted me because I put in the time. And so, so I had a great relationship. So that was an advantage as a woman. As a woman, it was like, I, I wasn't a competitor. Um, I wasn't, you know, jockeying them to be their friend. I was their, you know, they saw I was their servant. Like I was there to get the job done and I was their advocate. And then as I, I grew up and grew up and had power, they saw I used it all for the right reasons. I would go fight with MTV on their behalf and, and they knew it. I would go fight with BET to get on the award show. And um, they loved, you know, that I was, you know, I was a woman and they liked the fact that like, you know, they could, we could have sweet talk and be nice to each other, but they also saw that I was really fierce and that I used my, um, my power for good. So I never thought of it ever as being a disadvantage. I think the reason why I stood out like a sore thumb is because I was a woman and um, in a field in hip hop music when there really weren't any. And, um, you know, even to this day, it's like I go into the Warner Music Group boardroom and um, there's no women. And I'm surrounded by a sea of men. And, um, you know, I smile and, you know, I do my shtick. And I stand out like a sore thumb, which I think I make the best impression because I'm not a suit. I'm not a dude. I'm not one of many. To use Pharrell's word, I am other. You know? And so I, I loved it. I, I always relished the fact that... Um, I was a woman, and then I employ a lot of women. I have a lot of women that work for me. Yeah, you do. Um, a lot of women, and a lot of women in very powerful positions in my company. Um, because, listen, we offer a different perspective. The demographic, the, the biggest demographic of people that buy music are women. Women buy, buy more records than, than men do. Okay. Um, so we're the demo. Okay. So Unless you're a Rush fan. 
Yeah, I've, I've just learned that recently. Very peculiar, Rush fans, mm -hmm. hardcore. Mm -hmm. um, so everybody here is a student, an academic. Some, some are at a community college, some are at a four-year college. Mm -hmm. You went to Tulane, you know, four years. Yeah. Talk about, from your perspective, what the college degree, because I always have people come up to me every so often during a semester and go, so if I do well in this class, am I going to get a job? Now, you didn't have a degree, you didn't go for a degree in music business, no. music education, or I mean, poli sci and English, right? Mm -hmm. So how, how do you feel that the college education helped you get where you are today? I mean, I think what it did was, it, it, for, for me personally, it just helped me grow up, you know, in, in terms of just um, having that time to go from being 18 to 21 and, and um, just becoming more of an adult and, you know, balancing a checkbook and paying my own rent and stuff like that and being able to be more of a skilled um, person and, you know, getting off my parents' payroll. You know, and um, but you know, I what I learned in college of just my own, you know, communication skills and balancing time, and you know, because you're on your own, and you know, that was you know, there was no one to there to say do my homework. I had to learn how to do everything and get it all done on my own. Which you know, for for me then to do this job was I had to figure out how to do it all. You know, when I first started as Lear's assistant, I mean he would just throw tasks at me and just tell me to get him done. And I didn't know so much, and I would have to figure it out. And, um, you know, I asked a lot of questions of a lot of people. I, I was very lucky. My mom told me along, uh, early on in life, if you have a question, ask it. What's the worst they're going to say to you? No. And um, so at Def Jam, I, I asked so many questions of so many people because I just didn't know how to get a lot of things done. And um, especially also as he was handing me different departments. It, it was just, I was always very um, vulnerable with people. I never pretended to know all the answers. I always would really just come clean with everybody and be like, listen, I don't know shit about this. Can I pick your brain? And I find that um, when you ask somebody, can I pick your brain, so many, it, it lowers people's defenses. Right. They don't think you're stealing their secrets. They actually want to be helpful. Right. And uh, I actually, you know, I have a huge um, college intern program at um, Atlantic and at the Warner Music Group. And I'm proud of the fact that we have all these college interns that come in, and I always say to them, you know, it's on you to make your mark at our company. Because we then hire, whenever there's an assistant position and open up, we all have poll and we say, Paul Sinclair is here, who runs our digital department, who lives somewhere near here. And we all poll each other, and we say, who is the best intern of the semester. And then we say, hey, and we call that person up and we say, hey, you're graduating soon. We have a job about to open. Are you interested? And because that person made their mark in our building during their time. And, um, you know, college, I think, you know, just, I don't know what exactly the purpose is, except for me, it was to help me grow up. Okay. That's, you know? that's a good answer. Yeah. All right. So, currency today, um, I think the Atlantic Group, you have three in the top 10 this week. Yeah, we have a lot of big hits this week. This was a good week for me to show up. I've got, uh, you know, Wale's album is number one this week. Furious 7 is now taking over the slot. Um, Wiz Khalifa, Charlie Puth single, See You Again, um, is the number one single. Uh, Flo Rider, we brought him back. He's having a giant single. Ed Sheeran's single, Thank God, is still sitting up there. And, and we just, Death Cab had a big album. And last week was Action Bronson's album. And, so yeah, we we've got a bunch of great stuff, you know. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. What are what are the, some of the things we can um, look forward to coming up between now and September? That, um, that we should be. Well, hopefully, what's going to happen is is now I'm going to get the Action Bronson single, which he made a fantastic record with Mark Ronson called um, "Baby on Baby Blue" or "Baby on Blue." Baby Blue. Baby Blue. Mm which is a freaking awesome record. And it, it's seeing a baby act that's so amazing and so um, interesting that isn't like everything else. And, you know, it's, I'm going to work really hard to fight for this guy and try to pop him off and make him a real, a real guy with this song. Um, Charlie Puth, who's on the Wiz Khalifa song, the See You Again record, I'm going to try and 
break him, you know, off of that. Um, what else am I working on? Um, you got Nate. Oh, God, Nate Roos, um, who went um, solo from fun. Um, he is super important. We're going to break him, God willing. Um, 21 Pilots, we just launched today, which they have an incredible, incredible record. Um, there's a rapper from Atlanta called Young Thug, who I'm super um, excited about. Um, Meek is going to come back. Um, we just dropped the Wale. Um, Nipsey Huss. I mean, we got, got a lot of good stuff coming. And then fall will hopefully be Coldplay and Bruno will come back. That's great. Yeah. All right, so I was going to um, open up here to some of the questions that cool. have been um, sent in. Um, <clears throat> Giancarlo has a question saying, having artists such as Taylor Swift and Ed Sheeran, who are both top artists on the Billboard charts, yeah. um, when you have artists of that stature, does that make you focus less on other artists who are not quite as successful? So this is the thing. Um, you're right. Big, ar big artists take up a lot of oxygen. They do. And they warrant a lot of oxygen. And so um, it's on the label to figure out how to, you know, run your company that the babies can get their unequal fair share of sunlight and water um, and oxygen as well. So um, we, the way we designed our company is the way our SWAT teams are set up. They're set up that the big boys have their meetings where, you know, we call it prime time, where they have focused people, focused meetings dedicated to their rollouts because the thing about big boys are you have to get them because they're the ones that pay and keep the lights on. So you cannot mess up an Ed Sheeran rollout because it has to be successful because we need his money to put into the, all the baby acts that we're developing right now that are selling no records. You know, and so um, uh, so we need people focused on him. But at the same time, Action Bronson, we've been working this guy for over a year, tilling soil, getting him ready, and he's had his own designated staff, and there's been separate meetings. And so the babies don't really, like, their meetings are different, and they're on a different day. They're on Fridays versus the Thursday or Wednesday big marketing meeting. Um, and that's how we do it. I can't speak to the other labels, but we specifically, by design, set up a system where our babies can just have focus breakout meetings so they're not a secondary topic in a marketing meeting, where it's not the, oh, well, we just spent all this time being super excited about Bruno Mars's return. I don't have the time you know, to put for you know, a little baby guy. Um, but um, I'll tell you, you, you spend a lot of time, at least we do, thinking about how do we use our big boys to break our babies? How do we use our leverage? How do we use our clout? How do we use, you know, our YouTube network to help? So therefore, you know, Charlie Puth's new video is going to be, you're going to see a little thing for it in front of Bruno Mars's videos on YouTube. You know, wherever we can use our, you know, systems to help break them, we, we totally use all of our abilities to use our big boys to help uh, the babies. Okay, um, a question from Alan Cohn, references our friend Kevin Lyle, mm -hmm. said that uh, Warner was one of the first to start the 360 deal for artists. Yes. Um, realized early that record sales were dropping, record companies needed to seek other royalty streams. Mm -hmm. uh, Craig is a strong believer also in 360 deal, according to Alan. Can you expand on your feelings of how these kinds of deals and how they benefit the label and the artist? So they um, put us all in alignment. We all are standing shoulder to shoulder, and we now all have the exact same agenda, which is I need to be invested in that artist 365 days a year, not just when they're on cycle selling records. Because I'm now a 360 partner, I will make that fourth or fifth single or video um, or work another single, even if we know it's not going to sell records, because there's a tour going out. And um, I make um, crazy investments into tour support. So, you know, I feel like if I'm going to put hundreds of thousands of dollars into help buying you a van, spending the money to pay for the band, and then spending the money on giving you better production each time, I should also share in the upside of your touring because I invest hundreds upon hundreds and then eventually millions of dollars. Like, Bruno Mars didn't happen for free. <laughs> no. no. You saw that guy on that Super Bowl stage. That, that was the culmination 
of a lot of manpower, money, time, support, and obviously him being one of the best artists we've seen in decades. Um, and he's the consummate professional. I mean, that guy, I mean, that guy rehearses, he's the choreographer, he's the stylist, he is the MD, he's incredible. But he needed a lot of resources and we were behind him making sure he had everything because when you catch one like that you give them everything they need and you don't say no and you give them they say i want a 20-piece band you say we can't you don't say we can't afford it to bruno mars you say we're gonna make it work and we're gonna figure it out right. and then you saw the live show with a bazillion people on stage and you said oh my god people are gonna pay 75 bucks a ticket to see that so you invest in it and then the next thing you know, people are paying 150 bucks to see that show. So <clears throat> any baby band that comes to Atlantic right now um, would need to be part of a 360? Heck yeah. Yes. And by the way, if you're a really smart manager, you want me. In, you want to be shoulder to shoulder with me. Of course. Because then you now get to say to me, hey, you're my partner. Pay for it. Because honestly, if we're not then I have to look at a P&L based solely on silver discs and downloads and now streaming. You want me to be able to dream that one day you're gonna be walking on Madison Square Garden so I can throw the P&L out the window. Right. All J just played on um, Madison Square Garden last um, Monday. Yep. Sold it out. We started with them three years ago. Yep. We made, cr they're a band from the UK. You know how expensive it is to bring a band and everybody works from the UK over here? But it was worth the investment because they just sold out Madison Square Garden three years later. It's great. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Um, if I was a manager, I would owe, even though other labels don't ask for it, I would give it. So you will be, um, you know, so you'll have skin partners. in the game. Yeah. Totally. Um, Valerie uses a quote, I believe you stated, saying that Atlantic was, one of, was the first label to earn more than half of its total music sales from digital releases. Yes. So um, she's asking an obvious question. Is Atlantic totally embraced digital sales? I used to work in to bring back physical sales back where they once were. And how has Atlantic been, there's many questions here, how else has Atlantic been working to evolve alongside the constantly evolving digital side of the music industry? Might be more of something. So we were the first company to cross the digital divide. And, um, and that's because we looked at iTunes and we didn't say um, that's a digital um, uh, business, we said, that's the new sales model. And we have to have our whole company think about it. It wasn't, we didn't just say, hey, digital department, this is just your responsibility. We said, hey, iTunes is everybody's responsibility. We have to be driving all those people that um, want to get their music from iTunes. We started putting that link everywhere. Like, really, like, we built iTunes. I mean, we were, right, we put that iTunes link everywhere, and we were driving people to Tuesday on iTunes, and we created the thing called the deluxe album on iTunes. We called it the bundle. And we went to them, and we said, we want to have the really expensive, because when you put out a book, it's always the hardback, and it's more. We think the first ones in on week one are core, dire, you know, fans. So we want to make the more expensive albums and give them more stuff uh, for the super fan. And um, we that we started really thinking about how do we market on um, iTunes. And we changed just our whole company and how we uh, you know, just handled our business and how we were driving not just to physical retail, which is still, still important. It's still important to a huge demographic between New York and LA. So we take care of them, love Target, love, you know, still give them exclusives and stuff like that. Um, Last year, I did a thing with Coldplay where I gave them extra music and they gave me a multi-million dollar campaign on, on Coldplay. Um, so we still take care of physical. Uh, we still take care of digital. But now we've had to morph our whole company over to thinking about streaming. And, you know, how do you market on the streaming platforms and really educate the whole company about playlisting? And is there a way to jack playlisting? And how do we, which playlists really affect the other playlists? Because they're really the new influencers. They are DJs. And so, um, like, there's this one woman that has a list. Her name is Elaine Lynn, and she's got, like, uh, how many people she got following her? Like six, what? Like millions of people. And she's got this EDM playlist. She's the only, like, private-owned playlist in the top of the Spotify playlist because all the Spotify playlists are owned by Spotify. She has hers. 
And then, so I said to the people in my company, who is this person? Yeah, Turns she? out she lives in New Jersey. I said to my aunt, person who works Spotify, I said, you need to find her and she needs to become your girlfriend. <laughs> because she needs to put our songs at the top of her playlist and you could watch in real time what happens when she puts her, one of your records in the top, how it makes puppies on all these other playlists. And wow. so, um, wow. yeah, we've had to change totally how we think about um, how we market because streaming is no longer tomorrow. It's here, it's today. And, um, but the thing about it is, is everybody has a different ecosystem that they consume music. Our job is to not tell you what ecosystem you should be in. Our job is to make sure we're taking care of you no matter what ecosystem you're in and get to you and out hustle our competitors. Where are you with vinyl? Uh, vinyl is a great niche business. You know, it's a great niche business, and um, as long as the indies all stay right. intact, it's going to continue to be a niche business. This global release date had us really concerned about how the, it's going to affect the indies, and you know, the indies play a huge role in, in vinyl for us. You know, it's not just Amazon. Okay, so here's this, this is another one here from Aaron. Um, <laughs> What's the most important aspect of a prospective employee that must be uh, on their resume before you consider hiring them? So, um, I don't, I don't, no one gets to me by a, a resume. Okay. So, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. What happens is my department heads are empowered to, um, hire all their people. The only person I actually really hire is, is probably my assistant at this point. Like, you know, I have the greatest department heads and I tell them to hire the best people. I said, look, I was really smart. I hired the best people. They make me look smart. You, if you want to look smart, you hire the best people. And they're also nervous because eventually their people have to come sit in meetings with me. And so they want to hire the best people because if they don't, I, in five minutes I can tell in a meeting if the person you know, is really quiet, if they're not a contributor, you know, did they have a whack idea today, you know, and so, you know, Paul can attest to the fact that, like, if I think a person's a bum, I'll be like, you brought us a bum? You know, and then, you know, make them crazy, or to make sure that they can help stay on top of that person to get that person to be a contributor. I do not like people who come to my meetings and don't say anything or add anything. Like, I hate that. Like when you come to my meetings, like we're in this together. Everybody needs to contribute. And it's, it's tough on shy people or introverted people who really do not like to speak publicly. And my thing is, is I hate speaking in public. I hate it more than life itself. Well, thank you for coming tonight. I, you have no idea. But I do it because, one, I love speaking to college kids because college kids are really like just the future of our business. And um, if I can, get one smart college kid to come through our doors and help make us a better company. I, I don't mind speaking to um, college kids. But um, do you look at resumes? How does that work with you? What would jump out for you for a resume? So I, I tell people all the time, it, it's interesting. Like, have something interesting on there, right? Uh -huh. Like, I just read a bunch of bullets, I did a bunch of stuff, whenever there's 100,000 of those. OK. People that write an interesting resume, like, ah, I did this thing, but here's some cool things I did and it tells a story. Right? So they should lie. Because we're, oh, we're in the storytelling <laughs> business, right? We sit in marketing meetings and it's like, who's going to come in and come in with some ideas? Right. Um, and, and interns get to, to do that too. So that's one, right? Um, and then I think in the interview, it's all about people, right? We all know that Atlantic is a group of people, and so they're either going to be a fit or you're going to tell me I hired a bum, and that's the whole deal. Right. And so if we think they're a fit, then we start grilling more marketing plans. Yeah. It's a fit. you got to be the right fit. Yeah. It's, it's, if you're working 100 hours a day, you got to be the right fit. Okay. Um, Marla asked a couple of interesting questions. One of them, uh, very current, um, about hailstorm. Uh -huh. And I guess there was a leak. And um, she was just wondering, um, the album's available now on Yahoo as a stream. Um, how do you think this will impact uh, sales? So, I mean, leaks suck for us, you know. Um, just takes away you know, all the joy from the artist who has this beautiful plan set up. Um, but, you know, when you're still in the physical business and you're shipping, you know, hundreds of thousands of albums, there's a box of CDs that somehow always go missing, right? right. And so, um, 
you can't, as long as we're still in the physical business, there's no way to really um, stop a leak um, from happening. Um, but, you know, we also look at it like, hey, if somebody cared enough to put up your music right. and it starts to spread and go viral, listen, the best promotion for us is our music. And um, you're never going to stop the pirates. And, and that's the thing. There's always the people that just are never going to spend money on buying music. Um, so I don't waste my time on them. I try to just keep our focus on the people that actually want to be on Spotify, be, you know, buy physical, be on iTunes, you know, and be on a service that we're actually getting compensated for. Um, and if you believe in the music, then a leak doesn't hurt you. It actually just acts as a way for people to hear it and preview it. I mean, no one buys a car without driving it. That's true. So I, that's why I always tell my artists, you better make the best possible album because now they get to test drive the product for free. That's good. That's a good quote. Mm -hmm. I like that. Marlo also want to know your thoughts on, um, on the new uh, streaming app title. So I'm very bullish about um, any service where 18 gigantic superstars stand up and say, pay for music. Because you remember just a very short time ago, um, uh, was it Lars from Metallica said, I want Napster should be shut down because it should, music shouldn't be free. And he got decimated by everybody because people were like, how dare you tell us we should pay for music? So I think it's come such a far way for artists to stand up and say, our music shouldn't be free. It should be paid for. Um, and uh, now you have 18 big boys saying, pay for music. So um, whether or not it becomes a successful service or not, um, you know, it, they're going to face the same challenges that Beats just faced, you know, and that Apple is, is going to face getting people to pay um, for music. But, you know, if Jay-Z can go out on the road and go s see kids and say, hey, 10 bucks, that's literally two Starbucks. Two Starbucks, you get the entire world's music catalog a month. I mean, it's really crazy that, like, think about it, $10 a month, you get every album. And yet, it's so hard to get people to um, sign up for it. So I'm hoping that these 18 folks will put that message on their back and really um, go talk to fans and say, you can't be serious. Really? $10? It's $10. It's not, it's not that heavy. No. <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had Alyssa Pollock here. Mm -hmm. um, and Sarah posed the question that uh, she told us that iHeartMedia that one of the ways they find new artists is using Shazam and focus groups. And she was asking, how do you find new talent? And not that you're out at clubs at night being an A&R person, but... You don't have to um, go out to clubs anymore. Right. Um, because we have YouTube and we have um, so much access to um, so many SoundCloud and um, so many different places that we get to see in real time, you know. Who's listening to what? Um, you know, we get the, all of a sudden our research guy says, look at this band. It's got 12 million plays on SoundCloud. You jump on it. You know, you look at this band. They got a million views on YouTube. You jump on it. So we have a team of people that are out there, um, A&R folks, um, watching and seeing everything that's moving and grooving. And then once it flickers, then we pounce on it and we go into the marketplace and then we go and see it either in their backyard or we bring them to New York and we have them perform. Um, I like seeing an artist perform before we sign them. I don't just like seeing the shit on the internet. It bothers me because it's like, you know, it's, I don't know how to sign something without like touching it and feeling it, you know? I want to know who I'm going to work with. You know, I always say to them, we're about to get married. You're going to sign a contract and we should really be here a long time together. Like, so I want to get to know you before I marry you. So, uh, and you should really want to get to know me because you're signing a contract. You're you, stuck with me. And, and you're going to work hard to help them. Are they going to work as hard too? I know my A&R people get so mad because they'll be courting a band, telling a band, you're the, you're the greatest thing ever. We're going to blow you up and your music is so great and you're this and that. And I walk in the meeting and I'm like, are you going to work hard? It's the right question to ask. Are you really going to go the distance? You know, and, and, and they're like, you didn't, but you didn't court them. And I'm like, you know what? Like, I'm tired of courting bands. I, I, I'm with you. I want bands that 
want to win and mm -hmm. want to work hard and want to go the distance and, and let us all have that dream of going to Madison Square Garden. I, my dream, every time I sign a band, is I want to go to Madison Square Garden Stephen. and I want to have an all-access backstage pass and I want to be backstage and be able to go through the VIP side with my backstage pass, be right there on the side of the stage and look out and see the same view that the artist is looking out and seeing and seeing 16 to 18,000 people rocking out. It's pretty cool. Cool experience. There's nothing better. There's nothing better. Um, <clears throat> Melanie posed a question about Melanie Martinez. Mm -hmm. And um, did you, you feel that the TV exposure gives you a, head, a leg up on the marketing or do you just have to work as hard? So anybody that comes to us with socials that have hundreds of thousands of followers is always a leg up. Totally, because she came to us with fans. So when we put out um, this new music and we put her out on a tour, I mean, she's playing to a few hundred people every night. And so um, it was fantastic exposure. And, um, you know, now, you know, the job now is not having her be a voice contestant, but a real artist who happened to use the voice as a way to, you know, get there. And so, um, you know, it was really interesting. Chris Martin last year went on um, The Voice, and he was a super mentor. And he said to me, you know, he was a little nervous at first about doing it. And then he went there and he met the people. And he said, they're just like me. They have the same, they have the same dream that I had, which is they just want to be musicians and singers and performers. And they, you know, this was their path. I had a different path. But he was just like, you know, once I really met them and hung out with them and saw that like what their dream was, he was like, it was an awesome experience for him. So I convinced Nate to do it um, this year. And he also had a great experience because you realize it's just trying to find your own path to the same dream they all have, which is to be a performer and have fans and be able to do what they love. And obviously the TV exposure for your artists. is massive. Right. I mean, it's a concentrated audience. You know, you could get 14 to 16 million viewers based on the night. I'm going to jump around here to topics. Um, Nicole asked, what advice would you give your 22-year-old self starting at Def Jam Records? Oh, my God. My 22-year-old um, self. I'd probably say um, it's going to be OK. I've been a neurotic Jew for a very, very long time. <laughs> And um, if I would have known then what I know now, which is that um, it's worked out great. Yeah, guide, I spent so many sleepless nights um, always worried about just uh, getting things done or, or being good enough or being the best that we needed to be. And, um, you know, always just beating myself up about it. And, uh, you know, I still think um, I, you know, I haven't lost the desire to still be the best label um, out there, but I don't beat myself up as much anymore, you know? Um, I read somewhere you talked about how you, um, you handle employee relationships um, and you don't tolerate any sort of situation. Let's come to my office. We're going to talk this through. And here's a question from Daniel saying that he loves the way you handle relationships with your employees and how you promote respect and understanding in the workplace. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever felt that things have ever gotten out of hand and what measures would you need to take to resolve that issue? And lastly, do you ever think you made a wrong decision? Oh my God, I make mistakes all the time. I make, I, I, you know, we call wrong singles all the time. Um, we, we make we make mistakes all the time, you, you know, which is everyone's going to make mistakes, right? Um, you just got to learn from them. You know, we try things all the time. We think this thing's going to be the thing that's going to sell us all the records. And we take the premiere over here on, you know, on Facebook and it didn't do anything. It didn't drive any more sales. Um, what did we learn from it? Um, and when it comes to employee relationships, um, you know, I, listen, everyone knows I, I have one way I'm honest. And the thing I cannot stand is when people are dishonest. And I don't want anyone being dishonest amongst themselves. Like, I don't like side talk. I don't like, if you have an opinion, say it, you know? And, um, and if you think somebody's not doing a good job, don't come and tell me, go talk to them. We're all in this together, it's our company. So what happens is, is you know, if you come and you complain to me about someone, then usually what ends up happening is, is 
I say, hey, what did you just say about that person? Hold on one second. You'll get that person in my office right now. And then that person comes, and that person is sitting there the whole time dying, going, oh, no. And then that person walks in, and I say, yo, Steve says you, your job on this project stunk. And then you die, and that person looks at you, and I say, so let's talk it out. And then we clear the air right then and there, and we figure out what went wrong, what happened, or who did. Um, let's just put it all out in the open because, listen, real relationships are not based on high-fiving each other. They're based on getting through the difficult. And you know from being married all these years, um, when you get through difficult times, it brings you even closer, and you get a better relationship. And that's why I say to all the new artists, we're going to hit a speed bump. We're always going to hit a speed bump. How we hit the speed bump and how we you know, get over it is, is that's with how we're going to build a real relationship, which is going to make us you know, stronger for the future. Because it's never going to go perfect. No more, we've never had a perfect um, project. No one ever has. I guess it plays to the statement that it's always been and always will be a people business. Definitely. Thank God. Definitely. Yeah. Um, uh, Justin wanted you to elaborate a little bit about the relationship on the Zach Brown band being signed to Atlantic, or are they part of the Warner Music Nashville label? So they were, um, and we had uh, a three-album deal with them, and then um, we just um, our contract ended, and now he just did a deal with um, he did a one-album deal with uh, John Barbados. And that goes through. Monty. That goes through, yeah, Universal. So. Yeah, he wanted to see how that was going to work. And she also wanted to ask you, or he also wanted to ask you about the artist JoJo. Yeah. So is that, like, is the album going to ever come out, he's asking? Oh, yeah, so JoJo is um, finishing up her album right now. And um, I'm not sure. This is the problem with the fourth quarter. If you um, plan on going to radio and you... Um, don't have your music out at a certain time, there's like a buzzsaw between October, November, and December of working records because, especially at certain formats, because there's Christmas radio shows. And so if you're not in play at a certain point and you're not one of the artists doing the Christmas radio shows, you literally can get, have a very challenging time getting your records on radio because the slots have been given to all these acts that are doing the Christmas uh, radio show run. So with JoJo, it's like we're just trying to figure out if where we land. Because for me, she's not a new artist, but she's a new artist again. I shouldn't be so presumptuous to think a girl that had a record like 15 years ago is an established artist. So where we put her out. So we might do things to kind of heat her up online and then go for it in the top of the year. I, we haven't called that play yet because she's still finishing up the album but her voice is so amazing and um she was unfortunately in a funky situation with um she was on a label that kept her in like purg a and purgatory because they held the contract so she wasn't able to release music for like i swear like 10 years yeah, so and, and she's amazing and um it's going to be fantastic but it's i think it's gonna it's gonna end up probably being in 16. i believe that when you rush a project you're really um, taking a real risk and that our best projects and our best chances of success is when we have a really thoughtful marketing plan and we have posts and we have tools and we have content and we've got so many you know, bullets in our chamber that you know, we have the best chance of succeeding if we have it all you know, figured out as best to our ability to you know, be in front of it all. Okay, um, Kara wanted to know if you've ever become starstruck by any artists you've worked with or interacted with. Um, so I sat right behind Bruce Springsteen at uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and um, I'm, I'm not a giant Bruce Springsteen fan. Like, I don't really listen to his music. My husband does. Um, but he was sitting right in front of me, and I was like, wow, like, this is Bruce Springsteen. And because um, I really don't get starstruck at all. And, um, I definitely was like, wow. I, I couldn't believe, like, like, he was just so nice, you know? So I got a little starstruck with him. But um, I'm trying to think anybody else. Maybe Neil Diamond. When I met Neil Diamond, 
I was like, wow, you're Neil Diamond, man. The, Jew, the, Jew, the Jewish Elvis. I mean, I, I mean, and I said to him, like, I paid for your tickets. At, like, I, like, I didn't even ask for a freebie from Irving. Like, I, I bought his tickets, and I bought good chairs, too. He must have sang Sweet Caroline, that hook, 50 times in a row. <laughs> One more time. I mean, it was just, it was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Devin want to know if there's any skills that you learned when you were working in the New Orleans um, teaching situation and, um, that you applied to your current position. So um, I had the third grade. And um, unfortunately, most of my kids couldn't read. And um, I wasn't prepared for that at all. What do you do when you have, because they give you a syllabus that you have to follow. Um, because they were taking certain standardized tests at the end of the year. So I was completely thrown off that no one could read. And um, so I um, called my parents and I cried. And I said, you know, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. I need, um, I need different primers. I need, you know, different books that could um, help me teach reading that were basically like kindergarten and first grade level books. And um, my parents were kind enough to send me a credit card and say they were devastated to hear that, like, I didn't have books and resources and stuff. And they said, you know, these children shouldn't go without. And I went to Kinko's. I made lots of copies. And um, but then was the challenge of actually now getting one on one time. Because really reading is something you really and there's just a. You didn't want to call them out and do right. the embarrass. It was really challenging. So I, during my time at Tulane, worked at the law school. I worked in the admissions office. And um, so I literally went to the um, dean at Tulane, and I said, can I please go speak to your African-American student association? And he said, of course. And I went to their first meeting. I introduced myself. And I said, hi, I'm, I'm Julie Greenwald. Last year, um, I worked in the admissions office. Um, I now do Teach for America. I decided to push off going to law school. Um, and I'm in a classroom of 28, year old, 28 little students that really can't read. And um, I need help. And I need assistance. And I am not a great role model for these kids. Is there any way I could Jewish guilt you to come to my classroom and we can do this if we can um, divide and conquer? And if I can get a ton of you in there, we can spend the afternoons working on reading because we could break up into tiny little groups. And um, I convinced them all to come. Every day I had probably four or five volunteers every day to work um, with these kids. And it taught me how to be really resourceful and that there's strength in numbers. And um, I always roll as a team. I always, when we're going to close an artist, it's never the, the Julie Greenwald, the Craig Kalman show. All we need to do is get the artist into the New York office and meet the team. And um, you know, you gotta use whatever resources you can find to accomplish the job, which is it takes a village to break an act. So the more resources and the more people I can convince to help me break that artist. I mean, I learned a lot of different um, skills while I was uh, in New Orleans to teach me um, how to get ready to do this job, you know, which is, it's another, you know, it's all TLC. So it really did provide you with a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And by the way, I listened to a lot of hip hop music that year. In, in a weird way, God was like setting me up for something, you know, because I went from that classroom to an all, so that was an all African American school. Um, and then I went to an all African American company. There were only like three white people at Def Jam when I got there. And it was, and, I, and they would play, I would let them stay in my classroom after school um, if they would do their homework. And then after they did their homework, I'd let them play music. So I listened to a lot of probably Southern rap um, that year as well, so. Yeah. Looking back at your career at Atlantic, what would you say one of the things you're most proud of? At Atlantic? Um, you know, I'm most proud of the fact that um, probably the, um, 
the majority of the people that um, are there with me have been there with me. That um, I signed up an incredible group of people who um, signed on to the mission and we've stayed as just a tight unit. And, um, and so we're a very well seasoned home um, for new artists and for our established acts. We, you know, it's, being an artist is, like I said, it's really tough and challenging. We're their stable home life. We're there 24 seven and we provide um, what they need to help them accomplish, you know, their dreams. And uh, because I can't say it's one act. I mean, these are all my babies. You know what I mean? I'm proud of the fact that Hailstorm can sell. They just sold out the um, the Roundhouse in London, you know, and they'll sell out thousands and thousands of seats. And then I have Bruno Mars. I have Ed. You know, I've got so many different babies. Alt J, Trey Songs, and Chris Brown just did a co-headline tour. And so I mean, it's like I have so many. Knock on wood. I have so many wonderful success stories that it's not just the artists. It's I I love the home I built. This is, this is what made me feel really good about Atlantic. Um, the weekend that Ahmed died, Ahmed hit his head on a Saturday night. He went out to a Rolling Stones concert. That Friday, we had a breakfast, and we were celebrating the fact that Atlantic was on fire. It was the year we'd broken Gnarls Barkley, Panic at the Disco, Paramore, James Blunt, I mean, Trey Songs, T.I., crazy we had an unbelievable banner year and um we threw a lunch for all uh breakfast for all the department heads um craig and i to just say thank you um and he stood up and he gave the greatest speech and i'm only sorry that we didn't record it because we didn't know to um and he talked about how atlantic was back and he was able to see his company come back and be hot and be important and be relevant and matter and have unbelievable artists and he, you know, gave compliments to me and to Craig. Mm -hmm. And then, um, literally, he died that weekend. Like, I gave that man closure. That's probably one of my proudest accomplishments at Atlantic. So you could say Atlantic has changed your life. Yeah, oh, totally. I, I mean, I love it, you know. I mean, you know being in the music business is a young person's sport. I'm out four nights a week, right? Like. You know, you gotta you, you want to do it because you love it, right? And I love my um, Atlantic is just as much of a crazy home life as my crazy home life. You know, um, most of the students here, as as music industry majors, are musicians. Uh huh. And I just wondered, running Atlantic, are you, do you have any musical prowess or skills? No. <laughs> I love it. I love music. You canoodle around on anything, you know? I mean, I took, I took clarinet up until like, you know, 11th grade or something like that, and I took piano lessons too, but no, I mean, I just. I, the only person in the company that can work the AV machine. Yeah. Right, the stereo. Yeah, I work the stereo machine inside the. Yeah. The AV squad. Yeah, yeah. But I, I mean, I love it, you know, but I'm very, I love not being famous. But you are. No, I am not famous. In the industry you are. Uh, yeah, maybe in the industry, but I, I love being anonymous. I love being behind the scenes. I love it. Like, I like being the person that helps the artist get all the, the limelight. Like, you know, I love my role in it. I, I, don't, I don't want to be in front of the camera. I like being right back there. That's why when your guy was like, are you filming you? I was like, oh, shit, there's no beauty lighting. What did I sign up for? You know? Um, I bet there's some questions that haven't been addressed here that some of you didn't have a chance to, or maybe there's some follow-up. Does anybody have any questions they want to ask? Yes, ma'am. Um, an interview that you did with Jewish Woman Magazine mm -hmm. basically said that you like to maintain a hand-stitch type of company. Yeah. How do you maintain that? How do you make sure that happens when a company is growing constantly? So, um, so like I said, I still sit in you know all of the marketing meetings and um, making sure that the ideas are not regurgitated ideas, but unique to each project. And um, I have really you know the people that have come up with me now, you know I've mentored them to have the same 
you know, stomach as me, which is we share the same kind of philosophies of what kind of company we want it to be. You know, everybody knows this isn't my company, it's our company. And, you know, everybody wants the same, we have the same goals. We want to be the best in class. We want our artists, when they bump into another artist at the bar at an award show, we don't want them talking shit about us. We want to be like, yo, Atlantic's the truth, man. They're the best. And, um, which is great because this is what happens. We, when I go to sign a new artist, I say, yo, call any of my acts. Ask them about us. You shouldn't just sign with us just on this meeting and talk to the acts that made it and also talk to the acts that didn't make it. And, you know, for the most part, it's like we get glowing reviews, even with the artists that, you know, we bumped our heads on because we swung really hard and we tried really hard. Um, and so um, if you get people to have the same mission statement and really believe it, like, I don't have to watch every little detail because my crew is also looking out and wanting the same thing as me, which is, you know, this is, when you come to Atlantic, you're signing for all of us. You're not signing for a logo. You're signing for the people behind the logo. Yes, sir. Um, a student who couldn't be here tonight, yeah. uh, named Bobby Mahoney, had a question. He wants to know, uh, why does a band need or would want a record deal in today's world? What's the incentive when they can do so much by themselves? You know, we ask ourselves that all the time. Why are we necessary? Why do we matter? And, um, and it's because it's a big, large world out there. And um, connecting all the, the um, dots takes a lot of people. And um, we're resources, you know? And um, we also have a digital infrastructure to make sure that, you know, your content, you know, gets up onto 97 million different platforms, not only in the United States, but around the globe. But we make things easier so the artists can stay doing what they need to do, which is be the artist. Because um, the artist has a lot of work to do. And um, we are you know, introducing you to so many creative directors who can help you make unbelievable visuals. We can introduce you to you know, new producers, new writers, new engineers, new mixers to help you um, hone your craft and make better songs or better production. Um, and then it comes to if you want to be on radio, Getting on radio was really challenging because the United States, there's a million different um, stations all over the country and we're very fragmented and except for Sirius Radio, which is a national platform. And so if you want us to go put your record on radio and do it in a way that it all builds together because the, at the end of the day, really what you want is when it's one market here, one market there, it's disjointed. To conquer America, you want a really well thought out campaign so when you're catching all that radio airplay your video is everywhere your music is being licensed we're getting you television opportunities to then perform your song on either late night television or morning television it's it's how big do you want to become and if you really want to become big you need there's been very few artists to become really big i mean macklemore used warner brothers records to go knock down radio they didn't they had a gigantic major working them. Right. A gigantic major working them 24 seven, putting them all over radio and bringing them in opportunities. So it's, you know, they stood up and said, we're an indie. It, we, there was an asterisk. Right. They hired a major to help them. It's, it's, and then also just the coordination of the globe. When you're thinking globally, like we give you a full infrastructure that helps you coordinate so you don't have to go license your songs or your album by individual country. We can provide a beautiful, coherent um, map. So when you go and tour Europe, you're going into our offices in Paris, our offices in Hamburg, our offices in London, and really, and you have people on the ground setting up all the right interviews, getting you on television, getting you on radio. So it's a real, it just, it, it comes down to how cohesive of a campaign do you want. So you, you deal with your counterparts in other countries oh, yeah. quite a bit. Are you having meetings every, you know, on the phone or whatever? Every, so every we... Wednesday? Is your international meeting or something? So there is an international meeting every Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> every Wednesday there's an international um, meeting where um, the records that are being moved around the globe are all being discussed to make sure because this is the thing. Our timing is a record takes us God knows how long to go get a record in America. But in London, 
you in the UK, you literally have an eight week window because the UK, the radio station will play your record for eight weeks, that's it. So you have to line up everything when you're dropping your video, when you're sticking it on iTunes, because if you don't have it within those eight weeks, you're done and over. France's window is two months. Germany's window, everybody has a different window. And so what we do is we'll coordinate and make sure that if we can deliver the artist to be there during certain single launches, it just makes it that much more powerful. So we'll coordinate everything for um, the artist and make sure that these countries are all getting the right tools and their assets. Because remember, we're, once we put it up here on YouTube, it's now out everywhere. So then what are we giving to that country to then you know, make it more special? Here's a new remix. Here's a new piece of content. Here's something so, you know, to freshen it up and to give that country something that they can then go and work. It's a lot of coordination. If you want a global career, not everybody signs up for a global career because it takes a lot more out of the artist. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, sir. I would like to ask what you could suggest like, to your artist uh, to actually offer you some of their tunes, like they'd be eligible actually that you, that you start to work with them. What, what is very important? What's important for a new artist? Yeah, I mean, to be, to be actually, that you will work for them. Um, so we, for us, it's, we need to love your music. We need to, um, that's first and foremost. Like, we have to fall in love with your music, and then um, we want to see you play live and know that we're, we're going to be able to um, sell that music because there's only so much a label can do to convince the public why they should buy into that artist. Having that artist show up and perform is the thing that seals the deal. So we need to see you live and love your music and then see you live and even if you're not great but we see something that says hey if we can really just get you on the road and help you get your sea legs together because you know if you guys if any of you read the book um the uh outliers the beatles had ten thousand hours before you know and it's true before we signed bruno he was performing every week in los angeles at like a bowling alley so by the time we got to bruno he was a seasoned performer he was a covers. He was doing covers, and um, and that's the thing. And so we want to love your music. We want to know that you want to also be a touring act. That you want to be a performer, and that you want to love it. And then um, we want to get into your work ethic. And a lot of the times we find you because artists are big on social media, and they've also figured out how to you know get their music out there, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, you know YouTube or SoundCloud or something you know so so what's the best way to for example to to show show stuff let's say that uh, somebody has the good tunes it means how they get contact right? so this is so they our a and r people are constantly probably are constantly receiving music um a lawyer says oh my god you check this out um a lot of the times a blogger Key bloggers, my a and R people are following key bloggers. If a key blogger writes about it and says, oh my God, this artist is unbelievable, they go and check it out. Um, and then um, getting your own fan base, putting your stuff up on, on SoundCloud and starting to work it yourself. If they see that people are actually listening to you, they come and find you. All the labels do. All the labels are set up. They all have research people that are constantly scanning SoundCloud um, to see who's getting views and who's getting, you know, what songs are being listened to. Um, but you get a jump start if the right blogger writes about you. And, and there's so many blogs that all they want to do is write about the next big thing or the next new thing. So um, you just got to get your music out there. You know, coming, I don't know if, I don't, people stop me all the time and, and hand me CDs and I'm not allowed to take them just by law. Like, because there was a law precedent where someone sued a record company person because they said, oh, I gave, I gave you a CD, whatever, and my music ended up getting sampled. So you can't put it in my hands. I'm not allowed to take it. So. Sir. There are a lot of um, talented artists out there. Definitely. They don't have, like, such a big fan base. Mm -hmm. What are the odds of you guys signing the artists and helping them grow? So... We do that too, um, and that's where 
somebody turns us on to it. There's a lawyer, there's a fellow artist, there's somebody in the business who says, you've got to check out this person. Um, there's just this raw talent there. And um, we see it and we love it. We don't mind artists that started zero, that have nothing going on, if we love the music so much. And then what we'll do is we'll work to help that person start developing fans. We, I have this little infrastructure that I created called The Shop where I've got this crew of kids that um, they don't have to ask me permission to do anything. I give them money and they work with the artist to just constantly create content and music and put it out and they work it digitally with the artist. And what it did was it allows baby artists, I call them embryos at that point, because if they have no social followings, just to find fans. And they don't have to ask for permission or anything like that. And I get that I have them just rock out and um, feed it, because it's all about content and creative content. You know, that's what really gets eyeballs is putting a great visual to music and, you know, feeding it to the blogs. So um, we don't mind taking on newbies that have nothing going on, but, but they have to kind of find their way in, so it's kind of like somebody has to introduce us to that. If it's not going to flicker off of our research, then somebody has to, you know, yo, you got to check this out. So has it ever been an artist that ever you met personally that you were able to just say, you know what, I can try to bring Um, I don't know. I mean, I think what happens is I've met a lot of artists backstage at different shows that are be like, oh, I'm so-and-so. And I'll say, okay, let me introduce you to one of my A&R people. Because and the way I get down is I need an A&R person to be a champion because I actually don't make an album. You know what I mean? I need someone in my building to love it on the A&R side that's going to be the person that's in the studio helping that artist make that music. And so we have a huge A&R staff. Um, and so what happens is if, if I get a, if somebody, a lawyer says, will you check this out? I'll pass the music to my A&R staff and I'll say, hey, does anybody love this? And if somebody does, we take a meeting. And if not, I say to the lawyer, I couldn't find a champion, you know? Because you, you got to go to a home where there's a champion for you. So that's how, we, that's how we're set up to do it. Yes, sir. Uh, when you were discussing your experience at Def Jam and promotion, you said that less is more, especially for the urban marketing side for radio. Mm -hmm. Do you find that the grassroots marketing strategy works better for showing a single to certain formats, whereas in a top 40 you would need more of a mass marketing <coughs> strategy, or can you sometimes interchangeably for the two? So all you need is um, one market to pop whether you're alternative, urban, pop, rhythm, all you need is one great story that can set it all off and help you knock down um, the next city and the next city. Um, and that um, is for any format. You just have to surround. Um, I have an artist named Meg Myers. She's an alternative um, rock chick. And um, there was a guy in Kansas City who took a chance on her. And he started playing her record. and. Um, Shazam started happening. We started um, spending money just doing digital marketing, very targeted marketing inside um, Kansas City and getting single sales to happen. Then we started um, seeing more Shazams happen. And then um, we put her in the market. We had her perform. Then we did another Lodo show inside the market. And we really just blew up Kansas City. And we had a story to tell. So then we went to the next market. And we said, look what's happening in Kansas City. And then we went over to, you know, Milwaukee. And he said, Milwaukee, look what's happening. And then we just started going market by market so we could, you know, get a national picture. Same thing can happen at any format. All you need is one really good um, story. And that's what you do with new artists. That's why we always try to have a backyard for our artists and try to get the hometown. Like I have this other rack, 21 Pilots, you know, and really they were, you know, from Columbus, Ohio. And we really try to create that story from Columbus to tell everybody else. Only problem was the Columbus radio station didn't like the guys. Guess what? We just put, we just put um, their tickets up for sale for this coming tour. 12,000 tickets sold. So we went back to the radio station. We said, hey, you want to mess with them now? Like, you know, we have had to build it without the station. But, um, you know, for us, that's how we break an act, market by market, the hard way. Totally. Because this is the thing, we're not trying to break a song. There's a big difference between breaking a song and breaking an artist. Big difference. If you just want to play the chart game, 
there's a lot of labels that just play radio, play the charts. We're more interested in actually building roots in Cleveland so that artists can go back and perform. That's why beating up that market is so important to us. And that's why it's not just about the chart. For us, we're more interested in the market. In a session back with you guys with the 360 deals, that you are selling more, you are touring in that market. Okay. So it's not just a one shop, I need to sell records there, I need radio play there. I need to get everybody involved in that market. Totally. And we, we see a lot of radio artists that can't sell tickets because they just go up top and they don't have any real fans because they didn't come build any roots in that marketplace. So we like to do from the bottom up. Yeah. I can tell you a lot of labels that just go from the top down. That's not us. But that's by design. That's our DNA. Well, <clears throat> um, I want to thank Julie for coming. I know she gave up an evening away from her family. And uh, I really appreciate her coming here. So let's give her a oh, Thank you.